Welcome everybody to Print Hustlers Conf 2019. Couldn't be more excited to be able to do this, especially as it's just come such a long way from year to year to year. Um, you guys are really part of an elite group of printers who truly care about improvement from year to year, that 1% change every single day and pushing your businesses further. We always look at ourselves and we say, how can we help you, our customers and shops and friends, be able to push your business further? And I think this is one way that we can continue to do that. So this event is really special because every single year we've just done this to be able to help the community. This event sold out. It sold out 40 days before today, which is really exciting. Um, and to a point where there's people selling tickets on Facebook and reselling them. And so that, I, we were joking around that people were gonna post on StubHub. So that's really, really cool because we don't do this to, to make money off of it. It's really because we love being a part of this space. So we're really excited about that. Um, first, I'd like to give out a few thank yous. A first thank you to the Printavo team, Luke, Bridget, Laura, Anthony, Peter, Neil, Nick, Nick, Steve, although everybody's working, so. But they're awesome, so I, I can't have done this, especially without them. An event like this, we started a year ago to put something on like this, so thank you guys. We are just so dedicated to be able to not only create the best software for you guys, but also the best community to help everybody grow their business too. Another thank you to all of our sponsors. So could you put a round of applause too for everybody who's sponsored? All made Ryanette, Next Level, Supercolor, MNR, Clubhouse Athletic. You'll see a couple of their booths outside. Definitely stop by, chat with them, learn about it. They've got a bunch of free stuff so that you can take this too. Again, we couldn't have put on an event like this without their help too. So this event actually started three years ago. This was the very first one. There's about 20 to 30 people here, which is really neat. And about three months before, we were kind of joking around in a 10 by 10 little cube office. Three of us, we crammed into there. That's where we used to work out of. And uh, we said, man, that would be so cool to just get everybody together and have a little conference that's completely dedicated to improving everybody's shop. <laughs> Come on in, squeeze in. And we literally said three months before, F it, let's, let's do it. And so we just hustled really hard and built that out and had a, a, that space here for everybody to be able to, to learn from. Last year, we had a space for 100, that was filled up. This year, 200, that's filled up. And so um, we just can't only imagine where we're going next. Now, we've got a whole host of topics here, and not just topics where people are talking. We've also talked with all the speakers to give extra time for questions and for you to create a really good dialogue. We're going into branding, marketing, sales from inside and outside our industry, business lessons, life lessons, ban managing business and your family life, and then, of course, profit first. We feel that all of these different topics gives a really well-rounded appeal to be able to help grow your business when you go back home. We've also got breakout sessions. So one today and one tomorrow, there'll be three different rooms. This room where you can stay and two other rooms where you guys can be able to get into and get into smaller groups and talk about different topics around sales and training, business management, um, managing people, all of that to really get into more of a dialogue and a Q&A. Lastly, we've also got an after party tonight, 8 p.m., so don't forget to stop by. That's on your flyers, and you'll see where that is. It's a quick Uber away. So without further ado, let's just get this started. Our first speaker started printing in 1971. He's won almost every award imaginable, imaginable for specialty types of printing. He started his shop there soon thereafter called Mirror Image. I'd like to introduce everybody, Rick Roth. Hey everybody. So uh, a few minutes ago they were like, do you need anything? And I was like, 
kind of feel like I could use a balsa wood um, coffee table and a sport coat. I don't know if you remember, <laughs> like a motivational speaker like Chris Farley. But um, I'm going to talk about mistakes and lessons learned and uh, probably scare the shit out of you about a few things that have happened to me. Uh, but my wife said, you better start by at least showing them you're not some kind of knucklehead that doesn't know what he's doing. So um, I'm going to show a few shirts that we've done. Some people like Richard Grease probably are ready to kill me for showing the same thing over and over, but some of you don't know me. I'll pass this one around, but this is three-dimensional, and if nobody says wow, I'll be surprised. And uh, kind of our first stock and trade was doing simulated process. We've been doing that for about 20 years. I'll get into the, some of the errors that happened along the way, but we do a lot of um, our own separations. Won a lot of awards for shit. And uh, <laughs> the guy that works for me has the patent on lenticular, so we never enforce it. And then we got into doing um, special effects, so like fake tape, fake lasered appliques, fake stickers. We're the fake people. So, and uh, fake leather. So I'll pass these around. They'll eventually maybe get back to me. So I've never done a PowerPoint before. Um, so we'll see how this goes. How's that? This is uh, something that uh, I think is really important. So Bonnie Tomey used to run NHM, she's passed away, but she would always say this, show me somebody that don't make no mistakes and I'll show you somebody that ain't doing nothing. And that is true. So besides, uh, mistakes are gonna happen. And just, uh, if you can learn from a few of mine, that would probably help you out a lot because I've suffered greatly at times. So besides, uh, printing t-shirts, I've done a lot of other things. Some of you may not know that. Probably the most famous, I mean, the thing I'm most proud of is at uh, age 58, I batted 690 in my adult men's baseball league. Uh, it's funny, but Ryan Moore outside was like, you ready to go? And I was like, yeah, you don't even know how ready to go I am. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, like, like uh, Mark Coudre is a, a gourmet chef. People don't know that. A lot of people have talents out there besides uh, this crazy thing we do called screen printing. Oops. You know what? I don't know how to go back. So, won a lot of awards. Uh, can focus on this one. You know, was really doing well, and then I was down to two employees, two interns, me on unemployment and in debt. So I have like really suffered from some mistakes and some bad luck, et cetera, but uh, back on it. And then uh, like Printavo, trying to spread accurate information out there. I have the Ink Kitchen, you should check that out, inkkitchen.com. It's a free source of information. I wear this sometimes. This is just to remind me that uh, that's a big mistake if you think you're a fucking know-it-all. <laughs> because nobody knows it. So, I started in my basement. That is literally the first paid job I ever did. A photo got taken of the screen, and I printed in my basement. There's the first job hanging up on the line. I didn't even know what a hand press was. I used to take the screen, put cardboard in each shirt, print it by eye, and hang it up. And I printed thousands of shirts that way. I didn't even know there were printable shirts. I used to buy undershirts. And I printed thousands and thousands of shirts that way. At some point, even, I, I made my own automatic, which I don't know what the hell was, I was thinking. But, so I'm not sure this was a mistake or not, but I should at least bring it up. On the left is my house, where I did it in the basement. In the back, down the driveway there, is a carriage house that had nothing in it. And I really think I might have made a mistake a lot of times and I should have just moved into my garage and um, worked by myself. Like, I might have made more money, less aggravation. I'm not sure that's a mistake, but I think you all should consider that. Any of you have a small business, you might want to keep it small, actually. I, I mean, I, I know people, 
like a, a friend of mine in Oakland, he's always kept it to a one-person shop. He makes a good living, and he has a lot less aggravation than we all do with employees, etc. <laughs> then I thought I would start with my worst mistake. They run all MHM presses. They have a great safety system, which is uh, these bars that are very easy. If you have overly complicated safety procedures or equipment, people will avoid it. So I really like that this is simple. About 10 years into my work, we were printing, machines stopped, which is really, really rare. These machines run forever. I have one that's 20 years old that's never not run. But um, there was a safety error, and it's like two hours left in the day. I said that they could jump out the circuit till we got a part overnighted. Well, unbeknownst to me, um, they didn't put the part in in the morning. And two days later, someone went into the machine and was hit by the machine. And uh, that was probably the worst thing that ever happened. So I bring that up to not, don't do that yourself. <laughs> like, you know, don't, don't scrimp on safety. It, it's not worth it. Like, no one should be killed printing a t-shirt or die a slow death from breathing in uh, spray tack either. Um, <laughs> I show this one. This is not my mistake, but um, see, it says charge capacitors within this enclosure, disconnect power, and wait a minute. Well, you should wait longer than a minute. Um, my uh, salesperson um, was being helpful uh, that works for Martin Supply, Ray Chalk. He was helping somebody with their exposure unit, and um, how many of you know what a capacitor is? Yeah, well, you should all know. <laughs> Capacitors hold a charge so that things will instantly come on. And uh, Ray has artificial fingers from touching the capacitor. You have to take the power out of them. So safety, first and foremost. So someone just asked me, actually, what was the most times you set something up and it um, didn't work. So this is a famous painting called The Kiss at City Hall um, by Robert Duano. We had to print this in the early days. That's the original. That's our print. Uh, it's a little uh, messed up because of the size, but it, it was pretty good. We set that up and printed it 16 times. This is when people were trying to do half tones with uh, just like just one black screen, and we had to get Duano in France to approve this. So this is where the, you gotta think about your mistakes. <laughs> like for these mistakes, for it to come out crappy, eventually we learned to print the simulated process that we do, and it was worth it. You, what you want to do is make mistakes that will make you better. Do not make mistakes that, or take on arts and crafts jobs. I, I, I say to some of my friends, don't take arts and crafts jobs. If you're gonna learn something that you'll never use again, that is a really bad mistake to make. But, you know, if you can learn like we did, that's probably worth it. Although some people would say we're crazy. Um, someone pointed out, um, I was on this panel that Richard Greaves ran, and uh, early on I get to meet a guy that uh, had one of the biggest shops in the country, and he said, you have to have a vision that uh, and a, and a goal, and his was to be the biggest screen printing place, and he was at the time, he was cranking out Iron Maiden sh shirts and stuff, and he, it made it easy to make decisions. Like, am I gonna buy an auto press? Yes, at the time. Am I gonna get metal frames instead of wood frames? Yes. Am I gonna have an ink delivery system? Yes. So, you know, we decided we wanted to be the best, and, uh, you know, at times I think that was probably close to true. Many times I have regretted this and wish I wanted to be the richest. <laughs> After doing black and white stuff, we were doing color stuff by like, we'd break the red into two channels and the cyan into two channels. And I'm sorry this is a little uh, blurry, but, and it's not the exact shirt, but I just made in, uh, on Custom Inc's website, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever print them, print it for them, but you know, you would fuck them. Uh, anyway. uh, I don't know if any of them are here. Fuck them. Uh, so, we separated this clock tower. We were all like really worried about this. We, you know, worked on the screens and, uh, 
Anyone see anything wrong with this? Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. Lawrence. Yeah, well, I don't know how many of you saw that, but we didn't. So we're all staring at the clock tower. You know, is the print going to be right? And I think we counted later, like 18 people had seen either like the mock-up, the films, the screens, the people printing it. And it's on the goddamn like shirt, Lawrence and Lawrence. And it was still spelled wrong. Finally, like somebody walked into the shop and looked at it and like, what the hell? Like, so I think the lesson is when you're really concentrating on something, make sure like you take a deep breath and look at it again. And I have always tried to do that since then. A lot of attention, especially maybe when you've made an error too, you can focus on what was the error and miss something else. You always got to take that deep breath or you're going to miss something that's that obvious sometimes. Now related to that, stupid kind of mistake. So we did this print for somebody. All right, what's wrong with that one? Yeah, well, what else? So it's, uh, it was for um, R.J. Reynolds. So we printed 6,000 shirts. This wasn't the exact thing. I just made this up um, also on Custom Ink. So uh, uh, it was R.J. Reynolds, R.J.R. And um, we printed 6,000 shirts. And somebody else apparently printed 80,000 shirts. And again, uh, like we had a signed shirt, you know, for a sample. All these people saw it, the client saw it, the client had supplied it. It's supposed to be RJR, not RJJR. So like 86,000 shirts got printed spelled wrong. I told a friend of mine this and he's like, oh yeah, type in an arch, you always gotta double check it. Wish I, he had told me that before. <laughs> anyway, there's a little tidbit for you. Um, and then related to spelling, some errors you can do nothing about is what this one's going to be. So we printed many hundreds and hundreds of thousands for academics. I didn't even know they were still in, in business, geniuses that they are. Um, so we got some art from them. Instead of spelling it like one of these messed up ways, it was spelled like academics. So we really called them, it's like, you don't really want that, right? Oh, no, 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 thanks for catching that. So um, it was like a sleeve print. So, because it was spelled right, probably someone put it through spell check or something stupid like that. So uh, we told them, we fixed it, head of my art department went down and cut up the films that were wrong, except she cut up the films that were right. <laughs> and we printed 5,000 shirts that were very expensive, wrong. Like a lot of these have a lesson. I don't know what the lesson is for that. The lesson for that is to be humble and realize you're gonna make mistakes and be able to work through them. Because if you can't afford an error like that, you shouldn't be doing jobs like that. How long did it take you to not be stressed out about it? Like, <laughs> how many days did it take like an hour to, you know? Uh, in beers or minutes? <laughs> <laughs> We print for Sam Adams and I get free beer just to put that out. You know, we were printing so many shirts for that. I, I've never treated errors like that. Like, you know, I've had errors that almost put me out of business, I guess. And this one at that time was not that severe. And I was working well with them. So they softened the blow instead of like trying to bring me for it. But, um, yeah, that, you have to print a lot of damn shirts to make up for an error like that. That's for damn sure. Which is another lesson, which is to be really careful that you charge enough when the garments are expensive. So we do embroidery for um, a very high-end uh, outdoor retailer, and we charge extra. And they're like, why do you charge extra? It's like, what are you going to do when we make a mistake on a like $80 bag? You know? So that is a lesson. I see people doing that. They're, somebody that was at out with us last night, they're like, yeah, we know this guy printing sweatshirts for 30 cents. It's like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you know what I mean? Unless you're a Trustafarian or something, you're dead if you do that. All right, now we're gonna get really depressing. Um, so, this is also a lead-in. I, I didn't even realize it. So, um, we were printing about 350,000 shirts, like almost a million 
prints for them a year, and over the course of like what five seasons, um, holiday as well as the other ones, and um, then they didn't send any more shirts. No, no notice, nothing. Just uh, where's the shirts? Oh yeah, we're not gonna send them anymore. Um, so they were making them in Pakistan, and they started printing them in Pakistan. Right at that same time, we got embezzled. If you think embezzlement can't happen to you, or I'm a dumbass for getting embezzled, you got another thing coming to you. Most people are just ashamed, and so one reason I'm doing this is because you, I bet there's people in this room that wouldn't admit it that have been embezzled. Most people won't admit it. So at a time we had no money, somebody stole $80,000 from me. It was kind of a perfect storm of bad things. My trusted accountant, uh, who was my friend, got esophageal cancer and died. Um, my ex-wife um, left me with her five kids. My manager was hit by a car as a pedestrian. And uh, this person that worked for me, who like, was super helpful, except she was also helping herself. And uh, she stole $80,000 at a time when we like, had like poor cash flow. It's a few figures I got off the web, but basically, you know, the average is people steal at least 200,000 or more before they're caught, and it takes two years. So I lost 80,000 and it was like five months. Eventually found her by insisting on seeing the um, bank statements, went right to the cops, Cops were not helpful, um, but um, my lawyer, who I overpay usually, was pretty helpful because the guy that worked for him was the um, district attorney's hero. So they prosecuted pretty well, and uh, she got 20 years and uh, suspended. But so, but she had to pay back. So between paying back insurance I did not know I had and um, suing the accountant that I had got who had definitely, the most satisfying thing is the accountant had to pay more than his insurance paid because he really messed up more than anyone else um, besides the crook. But you know, they're thinking 24 seven about how to, to uh, get money off you and you're thinking about it for like five minutes and now I've extended that to 10 minutes. So. Um, and I don't think by being paranoid it's going to help. You checks and balances are really like where it's at. Like she started by, um, see, there used to be more CODs in the industry. So we would have to write, um, get cash and pay for certain CODs. So they were not really for CODs. She was keeping the cash and she was monkeying with the book. So it was very hard to investigate and check on her. I actually didn't trust her because she was being too nice and I was monitoring her email before people did that. But um, in the end, she got a card that was not supposed to get cash and was going to the cat, uh, going to the bank. She was taking it out of the safe. When she made deposits each day, she was taking cash out of a machine that took her picture. So, you know, the deterrent for not robbing a bank with a bazooka is that you go to jail and most people don't. She was going to get caught, but she had a gambling habit and I guess didn't care. Be careful out there. Don't be paranoid. Being paranoid would be another mistake, not the answer to this. Um, it's usually the vendor fraud is the biggest way, you know, that like the sort of like the COD thing and the other is stealing cash. You know, get a good accountant, get your bank statements sent to your house, not to your work that kind of thing. Yeah, I'd say that first one. The checks and balances. Make sure that more than one person is saying things. Don't, don't leave anything up to that one trusted person. Because you know, a lot of times it's either someone you obviously trust greatly or is super helpful or a family member actually, I've heard, is, is another thing. So that's the lesson of this. Um, I think that one about counting on systems protecting you, not trusting people. Systems often make sure people are honest. You know, if it happens, press charges. As it turned out, a couple of my employees said that she said, oh yeah, you know, it would be really easy that where I used to work, somebody blah, 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 and stole. Like, it was her, that somebody. And obviously, she had no record when it came to pressing charges, so um, clearly she had gotten away with it before. She's dead now.
but she did pay back everything before she died. I didn't kill her either. Although I called the state of Rhode Island and uh, they're like, oh, uh, why didn't I get no more checks? And they're like, oh, she, she, she's, she passed away. It's like, oh, good. <laughs> and then I said, pardon me for saying this, but are you sure? <laughs> This slide is, um, that was my bank. Um, there, well, you heard what I think of Custom Inc., so th that's what I think of this bank, maybe worse. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't trust your bank. Like, if they wanna lend you money, don't necessarily take it. Like, you gotta think that through. I paid on time all my loans, and because, as it turns out, I found out later, like, why are they putting the screws to me? They wanted to sell the bank, so they didn't want anybody that was not an A1 uh, customer so they were gonna take my building my business and my house for like 20 cents on the dollar and uh, to get their money as it turned out um, a friend of mine um, bailed me out and lent me money against my building but um, you know don't don't trust the bank so last week I was with a friend of mine who has a huge business he just moved into what was a Walmart um, that's how big he is. And um, a day before the closing on selling his own old business, the bank said, oh, uh, we're gonna take the proceeds from the building and pay down your SBA loan, $900,000. Not a lot of us plan for not having 900,000 in cash. So um, appropriate of, uh, some of you went to m &R yesterday, right? Yeah, and uh, there's m &R people here, right? Yep. So, um, my biggest customer is Sam Adams. There's only Jim Cook and like three other people that have been there longer than I printed for them. So, I, I couldn't find the shirt, but we printed basically a bottle and pour before everybody went to cans. Like this, we printed 100,000 shirts, something like that. Um, they look great, shipped them, you know, kind of a tan color. Well, after two weeks, it looked more like this. <laughs> uh, cotton candy. Um, very, very small amounts of yellow in a print will pull back, and very, very small amounts of red will come forward. Aggravated by a clear we put on about fibrillation, you know, we probably would have been out of business. They weren't all that pink and whatever. Anyway, um, the ink was Rutland. You know, they could have stonewalled me and said, it's your fault, you're a dumbass, you know, get what you deserve. But um, Danny Sweem, who worked there, kind of pushed for it. He's the head of m and now. And they, um, they kind of took responsibility of now warning people that these, this color that you mixed was not stable. In the future, they, uh, you would make it with like tan pigments. But the tan made from the yellow and the red was not right. He actually put his job on the line and they um, had insurance and they paid off Sam Adams to, um, to cover that. And that's why you need friends in the industry. So that would be the lesson I would say. Michelle's here, right? Yeah. Remember that one? Oh yeah. This one, the, the company um, sent us art. They had one more change. It's like, can you make it? It's like, no, you send it. Somebody inadvertently took a version of seven versions earlier that had spelling mistakes. We printed it and they um, at first said, oh yeah, it's our fault. We sent it to you and we approved the print. And then later it's like, no, you should have caught it. 30,000 bucks worth of shirts, which we decided to eat rather than stick them with it, even though it was their fault. Probably a wise decision, especially since they forgot to collect all but five of it. This is a good lesson, which is um, some guy came to us with a ton of work working for Edible Arrangements. The guy working for them, uh, you think, oh, this is great. Why did this person come here? Well, it turned out he had stiffed somebody else for 20 grand. So always be aware of that. What do you do with shirts that you don't, um, can't use? You can make really nice rugs out of them. You <laughs> made those. Uh, and then the two things that you should most have in your um, place, I'm just gonna go over that instead of the errors that are caused otherwise. 
get a washing machine, and do dye migration tests. I would say like at least 20% of shirts printed in the United States are not um, cured. And you know, you can get all this testing crap, but you know, washing it and see what happens. And everybody's like, oh, I just use whatever. Whenever someone says just, like they're just always full of shit. You know, I just use such and such ink and it works for everything. No, it doesn't. You need to do dye migration tests and check things. And then um, we talk about some positive things here. So one is you want to have good friends and you want to drink beer. And then even though Satan is real, he is a cardboard cutout apparently. So have good parties. This was not a party at my place, but we had more fun even than that a few times. And then I'll leave you with an indelible image uh, that you can't forget. So. I didn't want to make a mistake and miss this trend, so I met with Bella, and they were like, crop tops are going to be in. I was like, really? Yeah, the appropriate crop. So anyway, Casey and I uh, decided we would make the inappropriate crop. <laughs> so there is a mistake we did not make. Um, um, I had one other lesson, I forgot the slide. I was gonna have a slide of a guinea pig. Don't be a guinea pig. Uh, at one point, we needed an 18 color press. We got the first one, one that the company had made um, and it didn't work and it almost drove me out of business. Don't be like an early adopter unless you got a lot of money and you're crazy or something. So, um, especially with all these digital technologies coming out, you just gotta be careful that uh, you know what you're doing. All right, how about some questions? I'd like that better anyway. Any questions? Was that your my fault? No, you worked there when it happened. Yeah. Okay. No, it was their fault. It was their I think you said, I kind of thought something was wrong with that. <laughs> yep. Well, you got to move on. Um, yeah. Up back there. With some of the mistakes like that, what, what's, what's the best way to like justify some of these things that have happened? Like, I know you're big on eating the cost. A lot of times I do the same thing, but uh, like, what's the proper formula that you've gone through on some of these? You know, there isn't ones? really a formula. You know, that's the thing. When I, I see people like, well, we just do whatever, you know? Like, you know, uh, my friend runs Jack Friends, and they have like pretty extensive, you know, thing. Like, all right, you do a sublimated shirt, you get lines here. You don't want to pay for it? Fuck you. Like we said, we told you, pay for it, right? Um, but, you know, he's on to the next customer with his marketing and stuff. And, you know, you can't do that. I can't do that with Sam Adams. You know, you have to work it out with them. And then how you work out those problems, I have the most loyal customers from that. Because it's just... You try to avoid errors, they're gonna happen, and how you resolve them is really key to your relationship with your customers a lot of times. Yeah. You mentioned uh, having insurance you didn't know you had. I've talked to shops that have had these big disasters and they do find out they had some sort of insurance coverage for that. Can you elaborate on that? And what did you discover? And what did you have you didn't? Yeah, well we had taken uh, um, insurance on other people's goods because we had so many in our place and that doubled the normal I would have had but I didn't know it and they didn't even know it the first day. I have a really trusted insurance agent. I don't like the Geico's and people that are advertising and giving you cheap prices, they're not going to help you out when push comes to shove. You need like a real person. Same as like your ink company, your emulsion company, all that. I see people like shopping around for stuff. That is the dumbest thing I have ever heard of. Like it, what, what happens when something like this happens and you don't know the people at the ink company? Like you're screwed. You know what I mean? You won't, I, I mean, I recently had a problem with some garments and you know, I buy a lot of stuff from the people and the contract, person I contracted for, the, these very expensive jackets um, scorched and it didn't look like scorching it looked like it would steam out and um, then they're like oh no it's easy to decorate I was like what do you mean but you just did some samples for me you you had to cut out a piece of sweatshirt to go around everyone and a piece of cardboard and it looks scorched oh yeah but you know if I didn't have a relationship with them they would have told me to eat it like it's I think that's like your vendors have to have your back you you, you that's like super super important you know um, Hey. Hey. Um, so I'm just wondering if you would do it again, like if you could. Go you mean go into my basement? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you mentioned you would just be like maybe a one-man shop, maybe, but like after all the. You just gotta know what you're getting into, you know. Like, just bigger is not better, just because it's, you know, 
we had really great parties, I will say. And you know, at times you make some money, and it, you can do more exciting projects with um, you know a bigger place sometimes. But I mean, Michelle, you work at a big place now, but you also did cool stuff on your own, right? Yeah. Yeah. You gotta balance it out. Yeah. Make yourself happy. Yeah. Well, what is your shop size? Shop size right now is 18 people. We have uh, two, soon to be three automatics, 30 heads of embroidery. And then um, I do all the sales, art, and like personally do the sales actually, art and um, purchasing for um, another shop that I'm partners with that has six automatics and 25 people. Do you have contracts with your larger clients? Ah, that's funny that you say that. You know, whenever someone says contract, um, contract printer, um, my friend Jacob from Jack Prince said, contract printer, you're a convenient printer. When it's convenient, they use you, and when it's not convenient, they don't. Now, rarely have contracts. It, I don't know. I guess some people do, but it's just, I don't know. No, not usually. I mean, they try to get things in writing sometimes, yeah, but no, I don't have customers that I have contracts with. Some people have managed to do that. I have not managed to do that, honestly. What would you say like is a nice threshold between employees and, and equipment, like is the nice person <coughs> being too big and, and being, you know, not being able to take on a, a quick 5,000 piece order in a week or something? Not dodging that, but it really depends on like your customer base and what kind of jobs you're doing. I'm really like, if you have trusted people, you should subcontract stuff out. I mean, I, I, know, I know how to do flock. I'm not doing it. Like, you know what I mean? Sub it out. You know, if you have one job a year, I know all these paranoid printers are like, I'm not sending that out. What the hell? Like, if you got one 10 color job a year, what do you need a 10 color press for? You know, just sub it out to someone you trust. There's plenty of people to trust out there. You know, just ask around. So, Sam Adams, how do you, we're working on picking up larger clients like that. Not them. <laughs> Alright, you're down to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty old, I once been that long ago. <laughs> Alright, so, did you, know the, did you know Jim Cook up front? How do you make no, a connection with somebody Cook. like that? No, I did not know Jim Cook. My girlfriend at the time, her best friend was the girlfriend of the national sales manager. So they had avoided all the samples they sent in, etc. Yeah. Um, and, um, then all of a sudden they looked and we were really good printers. You know, I could have got in there and we were shitty printers, it wouldn't have worked, but we were good printers. Um, I have analyzed at times, from the first contact to actually printing a lot of shirts for somebody that's a good customer, it takes three years. We've got a, a large- um, Almost always. Large construction company, man. I've had them on the hook and they're like right there and I just can't seem to close that to get them to come on board with us. They love what we do and I'm just trying to find out where to get the foot in the door with them. And it just doesn't I don't know. Learn everything you can. I mean, there's not a formula. Just yeah. learn all you can about them so you can do a good job for them. What do they care about? Quick turn, you know, Quick new turn, stuff. You know, you just got to figure it out. Price, I don't know. That, that, I don't know about any of you. Do, do you really find, like, being the cheapest gets yeah. you anywhere? Yeah. It gets you, like, nowhere. Yeah. Stay in your garage. Yeah, she probably should have gone bankrupt. I actually owed like 250 grand with no capital. And I dug my way out of it, paid everyone back. Why keep going? Why not say I can go work for this? this, this, this. I ask myself that a lot of days, actually. <laughs> um, it was, that, you know, if you want to catch me later, I'll explain more, but it wasn't that easy. You know what I mean? Um, it was easy to go, easier for me in my circumstances to go forward at that point than just plain stop and go bankrupt. That part, no. <laughs> 30 years that I've been doing it? Uh, yeah, mostly I like it. Yeah, I like t-shirts. I was wearing my favorite shirt yesterday. Two people stopped me to take a picture of it, which it's, um, it says farmers and then there's a, um, a karate guy and a, a donkey, farmer's kick ass. I did for Farm Aid, so you know, I like a good shirt. 
It's very uh, working class or like regular people can afford the art that's on a t-shirt unlike art on a wall that most people can't afford, etc. So I, I like it. Ron. Uh, that's time. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I can't read that before I took yeah, my glass out. Sorry. <laughs> this is time's up. Oh, thanks. <laughs>